Well, if you would this morning, take your Bibles and open them to James 3, James chapter 3. As our beloved pastor and his dear wife are away for a time of rest and refreshment, we're continuing our study through James and anticipating their soon return as well. James chapter 3, James chapter 3, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 12 this morning. And as you're turning to that passage, listen to these words from Proverbs about words. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life, that one may turn away from the snares of death. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. We see from those passages that God intends words to be a source of refreshment and restoration. And in the passage before us that we'll read here together, James is dealing with our tongue and challenging us about the words that come out of our mouth and where they come from to lead us so that our tongues accomplish what God has designed them to accomplish. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, They are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not so to be. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? or a grapevine produce figs. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. God intends words to be a source of refreshment and restoration. In James chapter 3, there are three elements James addresses throughout the chapter. The power of the tongue in verses 1 through the first part of verse 5. The problem with the tongue in the second part of verse 5 through verse 12. And then in what Lord willing will cover on Tuesday, the potential for peace in verses 13 through 18. The power of the tongue, the problem with the tongue, and the potential for peace. We need to look at the book of James and understand that James is dealing with something he addressed back in chapter 2 and verse 12. 
In that verse, James says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. James is telling us our words are, are those are things for which we will be accountable. So speak as those who will be held accountable, as those who will be judged according to the law of liberty. He goes on in verses 14 through 26 to describe the, the reality that your works prove a saving faith. And now in chapter 3, as we transition to his teaching on the tongue, he's also going to lay out for us this reality that your words prove a saving faith. And he's going to take us to the root of our words to consider what is the source of the things that we say. And then he'll put it all together in verses 13 through 18 in demonstrating and showing us how wisdom combines both words and works in a life that is intent on sowing peace unto a harvest of righteousness. But this idea of the tongue and of speech is, is something that permeates uh, the entire epistle. If we go back to chapter 1 and verse 19, as James encourages us and directs us concerning the Word of God, he tells us, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And then as he works through our approach to the Word of God and our need to be doers of the Word of God and not hearers only, one of the evidences that he gives for someone who approaches the Word of God and lets the Word of God assimilate into their lives, lets the wisdom of God direct their thinking and their lives, is that that person is someone who bridles their tongue. And he does that with a contrast in verse 26. Six, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. The Word of God will have a, a, a controlling effect on what we say. And if we're not bridled in our speech, then we're like the man who just glances at the mirror and forgets what he saw when we come to the Word of God, if it's not having that effect on our lives. In chapter 4, in verse 11, after urging us to humble ourselves before God so that we can receive from God the grace that we so desperately need, he deals with one aspect that keeps us from humbling ourselves before God. In verse 11 of chapter 4, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. James is repeatedly coming back to this aspect of our lives, what we say. And, and at the end of the of the book, he'll give us some directions about prayer after in chapter 5 and verse 9. He tells us not to grumble against one another so that we may, may not be judged. But then in verses 13 and following, is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is any cheerful? Let him sing praise. So he's working us through to these expressions of of submission to God as we pray and we praise the Lord. And then ultimately using our tongue in verses 19 and following as a means of restoring a brother or sister in Christ. Verse 19, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. 
This is what God intends our tongue to be used for, to pray to Him, to praise Him, and to be a blessing to our brothers and sisters in Christ as we encourage one another, and even as we rebuke and exhort one another to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in chapter 3 in the teaching that is before us, James is going to go in depth as we consider the tongue. And the question before us this morning is a very simple question, but a probing question. Are your words pure? On Tuesday, we considered the question, does your faith have a pulse? This morning, are your words pure? And Lord willing, on this coming Tuesday, do you sow peace? Are your words pure? Maybe this morning you have come here today and you are burdened by an unbridled tongue. Maybe even this morning it expressed itself. Maybe in harsh words to a spouse or children, or maybe as children with harsh words back to your parents or to your siblings. And with that question, are your words pure? Those, those words are coming back and they're burdening your soul. They're burdening your mind. No, my words haven't been pure. Well, what James will lay out before us is the importance of maintaining pure words, but he's going to also help us understand why we struggle so much to maintain those pure words. And in doing so, in understanding the depth and the root of our struggle, that's where hope lies. In other words, if we were to stand here today and, and say, you know what, just do better with what you say. That would be hopeless. No one can do better with what they say, just pull themselves up by the bootstraps. There's a much more systemic issue that drives our impure speech. And as we understand that, we understand what God has done through our Savior Jesus Christ to deliver us from what is our default so that our words by His grace can match the design of our God and our Creator to be words of refreshment and restoration to the glory of God. That's where we're going this morning. And all throughout Scripture, we find that what we say matters to God. Right? And let's just think about this for a moment. Our speech, speech belongs to God. We often talk about being a, a steward of our finances and a steward of our material things because these are given to us from the Lord. Well, the same is true with our words. Speech belongs to God. It's His invention. And the mechanism that we have been given was placed there by God, our mouths and our tongues. And isn't it interesting that our tongues are behind a set of teeth and lips? There's a double guard there. Turn, if you will, back, hold your hand here in James, and look at one verse back in Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, again, just so that we can understand and capture the significance of what James is telling us and, and what he continues to address throughout his epistle. In Exodus chapter 4, in verse 11, we have a profound statement from the Lord about our mouths, about our tongues. The context here, Moses is is uh, filibustering with God, attempting to filibuster in, in his call to be a deliverer to the people of Israel. I can't speak. I'm slow of speech and tongue is his, is his complaint. But in verse 11, the Lord answers Moses, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf, seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? 
Who gave you the mouth? Who gave you the ability to speak? Is it not I, the Lord? Speech belongs to God. He gave us the capacity for it. He is the great speaker. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. And so James, as a good pastor leads his readers to consider this important part of life. Are your words pure? Let's begin by looking at the power of the tongue. The power of the tongue. James chapter 3, verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. The power of the tongue James introduces to us through describing the influence it exerts over others. The tongue exerts influence over others. So, not many of you should become teachers. Why? Because that role of Giving instruction is a role of weighty influence. And your words will influence the direction of the lives of other people. So there's a warning. He's kind of giving us a, a shock treatment here. You think, well, why shouldn't, shouldn't there be many teachers? I mean, Moses actually wanted everyone to prophesy, right? But what James is communicating in his warning in this passage is the accountability, the accountability that weighs on those who are teachers. He says in verse 1 again, why is it that there should not be many teachers? Well, because we who teach, and he includes himself in this, we who teach, James included, anyone who stands in a pulpit and opens the word of God, we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Right? There's people here listening to the sound of a voice of a person speaking the word of God, investing time and and thinking and being influenced by that. And there's a weight to that. There's a judgment to that where the teacher will give an account to God for the opportunities and for the words that were uttered. We who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. And then you have this sobering statement, for we all stumble in many ways. And that includes the teacher's. We all stumble. And anyone who stands and preaches and proclaims the word of God has an acute understanding. I've got to preach this. This is my struggle. And yet, yes, by the grace of God, hold it forth with that understanding that we stumble in many ways. And, and how incumbent it is on those who teach to labor diligently for their lives to match the words they say. And how much it emphasizes the grace of God knowing that there is no one who is perfect. 
So what is the standard of judgment? Let's just take a moment here and consider what is the standard by which teachers ought to teach the Word of God? Well, again, let's go back to the Old Testament for an example. If you turn back to Exodus 4 again and look at Moses, back in Exodus 4, after the Lord communicates that He is the one who makes the mouth, in verse 12, He tells Moses, Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Then Moses says, Oh, no, oh, my, oh my Lord, please send someone else. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is there not Aaron your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. God is telling Moses, I'm calling you to, to be a leader of the people. Now, here's, here's how you lead the people. You say what I say. Now, if you turn over to Numbers, Numbers chapter 21, Numbers chapter 21, this is after the people have been delivered from Egypt, and they are, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 20, Numbers chapter 20, and they are in the wilderness, we actually see the Lord giving some instructions to Moses in verse 7. Numbers chapter 20, and look at verse 7. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. So what were the instructions of God in this passage to Moses? He said, Tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. But if we go down to the next passage, verse 10, Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their livestock and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. What happened there? Well, first of all, there was a lot of grace. Because even though Moses disobeyed God and struck the rock, water still came out. That's grace. Yet Moses was a teacher. He was a prophet. He was a leader. And the Lord said, Moses, you did not do what I said to do. You did not uphold me before the people. And there's a consequence for that, Moses you're not going to enter the land. James says, let there not be many teachers because we will be judged with a stricter judgment. And the, the paradigm of that judgment is the word of God. Is there the speaking forth of the word of God and the obedience to the word of God? And we can go through many other Old Testament passages. We won't do it this morning, but Samuel, he followed the word of God and God used Samuel to bring a, a, a reformation in Israel. Ezra, as the exiles come back, Ezra was a man who had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it in Israel. And God used Ezra and Jeremiah to bring reformation to Israel. 
As we head back to James, turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, our Lord, as He comes to the end of His Sermon on the Mount, in verse 15, tells the people gathered, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you you will recognize them by their fruits. And again, he's talking about the false teachers back in verse 15. Going on then, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And, and think about that. There were works done in the name of the Lord. And the Lord says, verse 23, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You say, well, if they did works in the name of the Lord, then what's the standard? Verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The standard is the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who hears the word of God and does it. That's truth. That's true teaching. And that's the standard that God sets forth in his word. Turn to another passage, a familiar one for us in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. As Paul concludes, comes to the conclusion of this letter, he charges Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God, in verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge, the living and the dead, by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. What's the content? What does Paul charge Timothy in light of the fact that the Lord Jesus is going to come and he will judge the living and the dead? How is Timothy to go about his duties, his pastoral duties? Verse 2, preach the word. Preach the word. That's the standard. And so in verse 10 of, of 1 Peter chapter 4, past James to the next book, 1 Peter chapter 4, as Peter describes the various giftings within the church, in verse 10, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, he says, as each has received the gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Now, verse 11, he's going to talk about two main categories. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. If there's a gifting to teach, if there's a gifting to speak, what is it that you are to speak? You are to speak what God says the way God says it the oracles of God. That is the standard that the Lord gives to us, and ultimately that standard is captured in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. If you turn back to Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, when we think about teaching what God has said, the way God has said it. In verse 1 and verse 2, 
the writer of Hebrews identifies two primary epochs of God's revelation. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Old Testament. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he created the world. The ultimate communication of God and the revelation of God is Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. And so Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians Chapter, well, actually, chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at how Paul describes and defends his ministry as a teacher. He says in verse 15, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, the fragrance from death to death, and to the other, a fragrance from life to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity as commissioned by God in the sight of, of God, we speak in Christ. And then in chapter 4, after he describes the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that those who, who deny the gospel and, and who ignore the gospel, they are blinded by the God of this world. Look at chapter 4 and verse 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He says, in light of that, here's what we do. For we proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let the light shine out of the darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul's answer to the fact that people are blinded by the God of this world is, I'm going to just keep preaching Jesus Christ. Because he is the total of God's revelation. He's the ultimate of God's revelation. And he's the one that will pierce their darkened minds. This is the standard of teaching. To preach the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the burden, the weight, and the privilege that is laid on those who teach. And what a joy it is to be part of a body where that is valued by those who come to hear and where that is the priority of our pastor and of our leadership. It's priceless. Going back to James chapter 3, we went on a whole tour of the scripture there. Let's, let's come back here and land back in James chapter 3 with the time that we have. And the reality is in verse 2 that we do all stumble in many ways, right? And this is an area where Paul even asked for prayer as a preacher of the gospel, pray that we may proclaim it boldly. Right? It's easy to stumble even in preaching and by failing to exalt Christ. It's easy to stumble by failing to exalt Christ in our words, in our conduct. We all stumble in many ways. But the point that, P, that, that James here is making is, again, that the, the tongue has power to influence others, and that has to be considered carefully as we think of teaching other people. Another aspect of the power of the tongue is the control of the body. Again, verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Here James links what we say and, and, and the, the discipline of our tongue with the discipline of our life. Bridle your tongue, bridle your life. 
And the idea of a perfect man here is is a complete man. If someone is able to discipline their words and, and to bridle their tongue, that represents an ability to bridle their whole body. If you listen to what Proverbs says in Proverbs, uh, the writer of Proverbs says in Proverbs chapter 10, he begins that that portion of, of Proverbs with a number of statements about the connection of the tongue with wisdom. Listen to what he says in chapter 10, verse 8, the Wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. In verse 11, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. In verse 14, the wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the fool brings ruin near. In verse 19, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. And in verse 20, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. And at the end of the chapter, verse 32, the lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked what is perverse. And what we see in those statements and in so many others throughout Proverbs is that what is said connects to what's going on in the heart. And so James makes the point that if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a complete man. That's the goal, a whole person able also to bridle his whole body. And in verse 13, he's going to pick up on that idea, who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. And that ultimately is going to come out in an ability to sow peace in the midst of conflict, to carve out channels of peace. The power of the tongue, it exerts influence over others and it represents control of the body. We see this in our Lord, do we not? We read of his crucifixion this morning. And as he is being led to the cross, there's an instance where the soldiers there, what are they doing? They're mocking him and they're beating him. There are words without control and their actions without control. And our Lord as Isaiah 53 prophesied, open not his mouth. Here is our Lord bridling perfect self-control as he carries out the will of the Father in the most excruciating of circumstances. James will go on and give us a couple of examples here. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, and yet it boasts of great things. These two illustrations, the horse and the ship, are intentional. A horse is an animal with passion oftentimes to do its own thing. If you've ever ridden a horse, you might have experienced that. Growing up, my brother boarded a horse with another horse, and occasionally we would go and ride these two horses, and I would always ride the the other horse. And this horse looked like it it could hardly do anything. Just looked old and, and tired until you got on it. And it's, I, I, I'm, I was on it, so I couldn't see, but I wouldn't be surprised if its eyes turned red. And it was like life all of a sudden. I have a rider to throw, I think was its thought. All right, there was a passion within that. And, and for some reason, this horse, the bridle didn't actually work very well. I'm kind of undoing the illustration here, but 
to illustrate the passion that the horse had. You had to pull on that bridle so hard to make it do anything. And, and one, one instance, my brother and I were riding from our house to the boarding place a couple miles away, and we were at a gallop through a cornfield alongside of a country road. And my horse, it was also blind, by the way, my horse was starting to veer off to, toward the road. And I knew, okay, we're in a cornfield, a horse with hard horseshoes that hits that pavement. That's not going to be good. And so pulling that horse, but the horse would not, would not budge from its course. And so we actually hit the pavement at a gallop and skidded across the road. And neither the horse nor I were injured, thankfully. But the horse was passionate about what it wanted to do. And James is using the illustration of a bridle here to to illustrate the fact that the bridle can can control the inward passion of it, of of a well-trained horse, not the one that I was riding. And maintain the course that it needs to go. And then on with the other illustration in verse 4, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So the second illustration is that there's this ship and it's being buffeted by, by strong winds, yet with that little rudder it can still maintain its course despite the external pressures. So the tongue, a disciplined tongue, a bridled tongue, is that which, which can bridle the internal passions to maintain a, a, a wise direction and can maintain a course in the midst of the external pressures. The tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. And at this point, James has laid out the power of the tongue and, and really led us to consider its potential greatness, but, but he's left it neutral with that last statement. The tongue boasts great things. So the question then is, well, if the tongue boasts great things, if it's like a bridle and if it's like a rudder, what's at the other end of the bridle? Well, there's a rider holding the reins. What's at the other end of a rudder? A pilot guiding the ship. So the question is, the question then, who holds the reins on your tongue? It boasts great things. So who holds the reins? Who guides the rudder? Well, then next part, he's going to answer that by exposing the problem with the tongue. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness, The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body and setting on fire the entire course of life and is set on fire by hell. What's the problem with the tongue? Well, there are three aspects in this passage. First of all, it's corrupted by the fall. It's utterly corrupted. The tongue is a fire. What an illustration. You know, water water doesn't expand naturally, does it? If you pour a glass of water, you have a mess the size of a glass of water. It doesn't become a tsunami that fills your house. But fire feeds on whatever's there and expands. Behold, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. You've all heard of the Chicago fire. I think it was 1871. A lantern got kicked over and essentially destroyed the city. 
and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a fire. The tongue is corrupted by the fall so that it is destructive. That's the significance of, of James using this picture of fire. Our tongues are by nature destructive. And not only that, it is a world of unrighteousness, a world of unrighteousness. He uses the word cosmos for the word world, and it, and it doesn't mean it's a globe, right? We see, we see that word world, world. All right, slow down a little bit here. Word, world, and we think round globe. The word behind it is a word that describes an ordered system. An ordered system. And what James describes here is that our, our tongue is an ordered system of unrighteousness. Our tongue is destructive, and our tongue is defying. It is ordered against God. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 that the unrighteousness of man intentionally suppresses, pushes down the truth by not giving thanks to God. It's ordered against God. It's a world of unrighteousness. It is defiling, staining the whole body. We speak words of unrighteous anger. There's often a sense, for believers at least, if, if we've sinned in that way, of just uncleanness. It is unclean. Paul tells us that we need to put away coarse conversation. Ephesians chapter 5. It defiles the whole body, stains the whole body, and ultimately it sets on fire the entire course of life. It just keeps going and going, the wheel of life. And the ultimate source is hell. It is set on fire by hell. The tongue is destructive. It is defying, defiling, and ultimately devilish. Alec Motyer makes the, the comment that the first feature of the tongue was that it is anti-God, the world, and the final feature is that it's pro-Satan. It's set on fire by hell. And think about what Jesus told Peter when he began to oppose the teaching of the cross. Get behind me, Satan! Why? Because you are not thinking about the things of God. You're thinking about your own way. The tongue is corrupted by the fall. Verse 7 through 9, what then happens? Well, every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. The second aspect of our problem with the tongue is that it's combative beyond restraint. It's combative beyond restraint. You have these animals that can be tamed, and you, you think about the, all the wild animals that have been tamed by people. Whether or not it's wise with some of those, we'll leave that for debate. But nonetheless, they've been tamed. Yet the tongue is restless. It's like a raging wild animal in a cage ready to snap at anything and inject its lethal poison into any situation. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. It's combative beyond restraint. We can tame anything but our own tongue. And it's important to note in verse 8, but no human being, no man can tame the tongue. He doesn't say it can't be tamed. He just said no man can tame it. In verses 9 through the end of the passage, then he gives us another aspect that the tongue is conscientious, consciously duplicitous. 
with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not so to be. Does a spring bring forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. How often... Do we experience praising God, blessing God, and then by the end of the day, we're grieved with what we've said to people? Throughout Scripture, we see this. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, in 2 Samuel eleven fifteen, 15, wrote these words, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. With our tongues we bless God and curse man. Peter, I will never deny you. I don't know the man. Oh, what a grief. What a grief. And James, again, as a model pastor says in verse 10, my brothers, these things ought not so to be. And he uses the illustration, does a, does a spring pour from the same opening, both fresh water and salt? Again, Alec Mottier, a fig must have a fig tree at its source, a grape can come only from a vine, an olive from an olive tree. Salt water has a salt source, sweet water, a sweet source, bitter words, a bitter heart. Critical words, a critical spirit. Defamatory, unloving speech issues from a heart where the love of Jesus is a stranger. And James ends this passage on a very sobering note. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. He just leaves it there. It's lingering in the air. What's the source of your words? What's the source of your words? And for a believer in the Lord Jesus, for someone whose heart has been changed, the effect of that is like Peter. When after he denied our Lord, the Lord looked at him and he wept bitterly. There's a response of repentance for our sinful words. But they're also within this last statement that, I, that challenges us about the source. There's a question, do your words indict you with a faith that is not genuine? There's an evangelistic urgency also to this passage. If the heart is not transformed, the words can't be transformed. And he goes back to, it goes back to verse 12 of chapter 2, so speak and so act as those who will be judged. We have to seriously consider this. This is a matter of eternal destiny. What's going on in your heart? What are your words telling you about your relationship with the Lord Jesus or lack thereof? Has he changed you? And herein lies the hope. Because although every single person enters this world with a devilish default to their tongue, there is one man who withstood the temptation of the devil when he was tempted to ignite his life, and he answered with the word of God and defeated the temptation of the devil. 
And he could say, our Lord says in John 6 and verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. And as people hear the words of eternal life from the lips of the Lord Jesus, he changes the hearts, the hearts where the devil holds the reins and he takes over. He transforms us, he transitions us from the, the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He then is the master of our words and our lives, our words that are patterned after our Savior. And this is what God's intent is ultimately, is to transform your tongue from a destructive force of nature to a, nature, to a, to a spring of pure healing water. Isn't it amazing that Paul can say in Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but only what is good for edification, that it may minister grace to the hearers. That's God's intent. And it's accomplished through the transformation of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So with David, we could say in Psalm 35, 28, my tongue shall declare your righteousness and your praise all the day long. Do you have a transformed tongue? Are your words pure? And by the grace of God, we can take the words that, that perhaps we've been the object of the pain, and we can bring that before the Lord Jesus. We can take the guilt of the sinful words that we have spoken, and we can bring that before the Lord Jesus, and we find cleansing and refreshment and restoration in Him. May the Lord give us grace to speak the way our Lord spoke and to live for our Lord and Savior Jesus. Father, we thank You so much for Christ our Savior. We thank you that he never sinned one time with his tongue. We praise you that he accomplished perfect righteousness on our behalf and we are clothed in his righteousness. We thank you that he paid the price for all of our iniquities, for the iniquities even of the words that we have spoken when he died on the cross for sin. And we rejoice in the liberty that we have to speak for you and to speak of you. May, the, may your character be the source of our words this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening from Truth Community Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. You can find church information and other helpful materials at thetruthpulpit.com.